Glory to Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He's truly risen. So we're reading the Gospel of John. We're on the eighth chapter with the 21st verse to the 30th verses. Um, the entitled Jesus, the Father's Ambassador in the New American Bible. And uh, in this New, Ameri this New American one, page 158 that we have, it's on page, and in the, uh, it's page 158, uh, so you got that, you have 158 in, in the, in uh, Martin and Wright, right? Right, right, that's, we have right, right, and that's right, all right. So we have that. So let's pray our prayer of asking the Lord's direction. We read scripture prayerfully and attentively. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Blessed Lord, who have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may wisely hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So chapter 8, verse 21, been following. He said to them again, I am going away and you will look for me, but you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, he is not going to kill himself, is he? Because he said, where I am going, you cannot come. And he said to them, you belong to what is below. I belong to what is above. You belong to this world, but I do not belong to this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, and note it, in the, it it's uh, in capital letters, I am, because it's a reference and they, people pick this up there to that, again, like the other I am say, the other, the, the I am saying, he's claiming to be God. Believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what I told you from the beginning, I have much to say about you in condemnation, but the one who sent me is true. And what I heard from him I tell the world. They did not realize that he was speaking to them of the Father. God the Father, that is. So Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am, again, I am, and that I do nothing on my own, but I only say what the Father taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what is pleasing to him. Because he spoke in this way, many came to believe in him. So, uh, the, of course, when, when it's the Jews here, it's the it's the Judean, hoi Judaioi, the Judean, and for most part the authorities, but also sort of the uh, the scribes and other people there and. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, Jesus is saying that he's come not only with the Father's authority, but with the Father's message. And he said, you know, everything, I, I, I do nothing on my own, but I only say what the Father taught me. So, of course, God is one being. So the Trinity is one being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So uh, the fancy word is homoousios in Greek of the same substance, the same being, the same essence. So, uh, so Jesus, because Jesus is also fully human. So he's fully God, true God and true man. So he, there's integrity in both natures. So it's not mixed together like, you know, you know, he's not, you know, 50% divine and 50% human or 75% divine and 25% human. He's 100% God, 100% human, yet totally united. So this is a paradox. So how can there be, you know, integrity of these natures and they be uh, united? How can the uh, infinite nature of God, the eternal nature of God, 
<clears throat> be united in one person, indeed the infinite person of, of God, the eternal word is God, with this finite temporal person, a very limited, indeed mortal, and this, and uh, even within the fullness of human nature, uh, uh, there, there's no comparison to God, even though we're made into divine image and spirit. But that's who he is. That's who Jesus. And he's revealing this sort of slowly. He doesn't come out and say I'm God because he would never have even gotten to the Sermon on the Mount. He would have been stoned to death, you know, by some zealots. Mm -hmm. Uh, right away for blasphemy and of course he will be it's for blasphemy that uh, in the, in the, under the Jewish law there that he's condemned to death but they the Jewish authorities can't, don't have the authority to condemn him to death only the Romans do so uh, they have to get him for treason they have to get him claiming to be a king and uh, with the to overthrow the Romans or something like that, which would be crucifixion, the death, the, the horrible death of crucifixion. So, um, so he says, uh, I'm going away and you will look for me, but you will die in your sin. So that, because they, of their hatred, that, that they will uh, die in their sin, they won't repent of it. Because if you repent, your sins will be forgiven. But if you don't repent... Now, do these people really know this is a sin? Well, if they know he's innocent of, uh, and shouldn't be you know, uh, killed, if they know he's not uh, guilty of treason and all that, <clears throat> then you know, they, they know what they're doing. But Jesus says on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And so, I'm going away. And this Thursday, we celebrate the Ascension tomorrow evening uh, at uh, uh, four and then nine and then seven. This is a parish commercial as I am doing this now. Um, but, and then, uh, but uh, he says, where I am going, you cannot come. You're going to look for me, but you will die in your sins. So if I were advising Jesus, I would have said, well, you could say, couldn't say it a little more diplomatically, but he, he in his prophetic uh, vocation, he's going to be very direct and blunt. So, especially to people who think they know everything. So, uh, he, he, his harshest language is for uh, is for the uh, the self righteous, for the, uh, uh, the the those who are in authority and should know better. Uh, and, and religious are his harshest, and that he would be. It's true now also that his harshest thing would be for those who know better. Uh, he said, where I am going, you cannot come. So they, uh, suicide is a sin for them, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they uh, ridicule him and they say, he's not going to kill himself, is he? Because he said, where I am going, you cannot come. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but they say, but, but he said to them, you belong to what is below, I belong to what is above. So again, the, they uh, think in a, a, in a worldly way, in a kind of way, and uh, using the weapons of the world of violence and all that. And sadly, many uh, people claiming to be Jesus followers, even people of strong orthodoxy, have followed that way and used the, the way of violence, of, uh, you know, Killing, quote unquote, killing off the competition, literally. So, um, so he said to them, uh, "You belong to this world, but I do not belong to this world, and we are in this world, but we're not supposed to belong to it." Now, cause whole cosmos can mean different things. That's you know, our word cosmos comes from it. it can mean the world because, and their their sense of. All that is the, the you know the sky, the earth, and everything. All that uh, they didn't know about you know galaxies and all this stuff. Uh, the uh, their wide universe they didn't. It was fairly constricted, but uh, it was vast for for them, of course. Uh, and that's 
that when God it says God so loved the world, that's what he's talking about here in John. He loved the world and everybody in it. So uh, loves everything of, of every creature in, in, in this. But he did. Uh, but then there's the world, which is the that which is in uh, corporate rebellion against God, that uh, symbolized by the Tower of Babel. Well, this is they were going to have a siege tower to heaven. And so they were, uh, and then, uh, but that doesn't bring unity, that brings confusion and conflict, because they end up turning on each other, which is the way of the world. So uh, he said, I don't belong to that. You know, uh, the, the way of corporate sin, though to speak, a group sin, I don't belong to that. I don't belong to private sin either. So, uh, so then um, he said, that is why I told you you will die in your sins. So, which is, which is the final impenitence, which is this, the a sin against the Holy Spirit. With that, uh, uh, because God craves to forgive us, but we have the freedom of the will. There's, there's no predeterminism. There's no irresistible grace. The uh, we have to respond to his outstretched arms. And he gives us the ability to respond by, by what they call uh, prevenient grace, the grace that comes before. That, so they, uh, what a, a, a friend of mine called uh, temptation to good. With, uh, so, um, and he gives us the power to do that. But if we reject it, we reject it. We have no one to blame but ourselves if we, in rejecting that grace. So... Um, so they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what I told you from the beginning. Because they have to connect the dots, uh, which they're uh, more than starting to do. And um, again, he doesn't, he, he doesn't you know, come right out and say, I'm the Christ. That would get him in trouble too. You know, he'd be arrested uh, and probably executed for that. Um, uh, uh, but he tells, I'm the Christ, to whom? To the, what, the, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, who was uh, an adulteress and a, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of this stuff, who is marginal, but who responded to his outreach, responded to his, his offer of grace, of uh, the way of conversion. It doesn't say, and then, and then she went and she said, to the guy she's living with, I can't live with you anymore. I, I need to straighten my life out or something. We, it doesn't, text doesn't say that. But the implication is that of her conversion of life. And also call, uh, the Samaritan people that she brought to Jesus, to come to Jesus. So, uh, but he tells her, but he doesn't tell these people. So, uh, he said, I have much to say about you in condemnation. Again, not the height of diplomacy. But that's the, the way of the prophet. The prophet gives words of warning and of hope. But here, but you have to uh, accept the words of warning to live in the hope, to uh, come to the consolation. So as uh, in Isaiah, the Lord says to the prophet, comfort, comfort my people. But, but first, they, it's... it's uh, Confront my people, going uh, the uh, so much of Isaiah, what they call proto Isaiah, is is with that warning, warning about what will come, and then the other is the consolation after the 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 damage has been done, and people uh, it's seem hopeless. Give them hope. So uh, he said, "But the one who sent me, this is the Father, of course." The Father is the monarch of the Trinity. The persons of the Trinity are all co-eternal, co-equal, and everything. One in essence, all that. As hypothesis, that's the fancy word for person, more or less. Uh, they're uh, absolutely equal. But the Father is the first among equals, so to speak. He's the monarch of the Trinity. So uh, I always think it's the person, they, they, their personalities, you know, their infinite personalities. Um, <coughs> that they, the uh, uh, the persons of the Trinity have. I always think of the Holy Spirit as sort of 
uh, not shy, but uh, would prefer to be in the background. So in the father, it's what is, is going to be out in front, and, and the, the son is sort of in between there. But anyway, um, that's that's the impression I get anyway from from that wolf. Uh, so, but uh, they're equal. God equally God, not divided. If someone went, I read one thing one time, and it was this you know uh, quote unquote non denominational church, and they said uh, the one God is is. is uh, in parts, the father sometimes says, no, 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 not in parts. It's not like, uh, you know, with three uh, Toll House cookies or something like that, but are in one container. It's not that. You, know, you can separate those Toll House cookies, but uh, they may be of the same essence, the same batter, the same d cookie dough, but uh, no, that uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one being, they're one in being, but they're very, they're truly distinct in person. Not separated, not in parts, or whatever like that. Not divided, consubstantial and undivided. Another fancy phrase. That, um, but uh, he said, the one who sent me, the Father, is true. Alethos. The, the Father is, is as authentic. So there's no... Uh, Deceit in God. There's no deceit in God. Uh, he, God is, is, is total truth. And Jesus, of course, in saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, again, is claiming to be God. It's the tr he is the truth with a capital T. He's the way, the way to the Father, the way in which the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and he's the life. A zoe, not just uh, hobios, vios, the, not just, uh, he's not biological life, but he's eternal life. He's right there. So, uh, uh, and again, in his humanity, and of course, in, in the, here, in the historically, he's emptied himself of the glory, even though he's fully God. Uh, he hasn't, didn't cease to be God when he became human. Uh, he went through our full mortal experience, even though he's without sin and everything. Uh, but now, of course, in his humanity, in the resurrection, Christ is risen, he's truly risen. Uh, Christos was Christ. Uh, he's truly risen. A risen in body, not risen... Uh, in, in some quote unquote spiritual way that's not real because uh, souls don't need resurrection they're immortal they need, might need awakening they might need to come out of moral death but that's an analogy to to biology an analogy to physical death because so we say you know if you're in mortal sin you're de you're spiritually dead and that's true, but that's it's still it's not literally true because your soul is immortal. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're hell bound if you're uh, in, in mortal sin. But God's grace is greater. God is 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 good. He really is, and uh, God is merciful. God God is just, and He's all loving. He's uh, most merciful, and He is all just. So that, that's why you know people say, oh, uh, some people say, oh, the. Uh, uh, if, if you die and you're a believer, you just go straight to heaven. And I said, no, you have to wipe the feet. You have to wipe your feet before you come into this house, the Lord is saying. So we, we have to be, yield all sin, all attitude, bad attitudes, all uh, uh, the fruits of sin, too. We have to give all that up. And, uh, and then... Because the Lord can't fill us if we're filled with all this junk. It's like my room now. But yes, I have, uh, uh, of the 2,000 books I had, I only have 300 now, but it's still something. And getting to those papers and all that stuff, it's just, I'd just rather do anything, it seems, than that. But uh, that's, that's uh, spiritual sloth. I have to do what I have to do. This has to be done. But of course, I, uh, I said, well, Thank God I have a reprieve. I have a, probably 
a few more years to get get to all this stuff uh, in my down my uh, downsizing. But uh, God is there for us, and Christ came for us, came for the salvation. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that all who have faith in Him might not perish. So that that's. God, God loves the world. Again, the world in the first sense of whole cosmos, not in the sense of the rebellion, not in the quote-unquote world of sin uh, or a culture of death or whatever, that uh, the a power uh, which is a rivalry to God, while well, the world is supposed to be in harmony with God, in harmony with itself, well, among all the, the members of nature and all this stuff. That's what it's supposed to be, but it ain't because of the the reality of sin, the rule of sin. Uh, uh, but God is giving us the rule of grace. The we, we Christ can be the, our Lord and Savior. He really can be the center of all things. So, uh, and, but uh, by grace. So, he says. Uh, the one who sent me is true, and what I heard from him I tell the world. Again, this is the world of the first sense. And they did not realize that he was speaking to them of the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, so in, in, in the crucifixion, this is like, uh, then you will realize that I am, and that I do nothing on my own. So always, because the persons of the Trinity do don't do anything on their own. But I say only what the Father taught me. So in his humanity, you know, he needs, he, he starts from scratch there in, in the moment, from the moment of his conception. And he has to learn, he has to go, go through all this stuff uh, uh, in his humanity. So the one who sent me is with me. So the Father's with him all the time, because he's the one in, one in being. But the Father's with us too. The Son is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us all the time. He has not left me alone. Because I always do what is pleasing to him. Well, we can't always say that, can we? But Jesus can. And Jesus in us can lead us to, to that. To do always what is pleasing to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, because he spoke this way, many came to believe in him, to have faith in him. So let's see what, uh, what the right book has to say. So this is the, from the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. So you, you have this here, the people here. Page 158, 158 in this. There you go. So this is what we're using. Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture was one of my favorite mosaic icons of Christ from Chefalu. Uh, there, Christ, uh, Christ the teacher. And um, so it's the Gospel of John uh, by Francis Martin, who, uh, eternal rest to him, uh, and William M. Wright IV. And this was published by Baker Academic, a division of Baker Publishing Group, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in 2015, 2015, and it's page 158. So, as it says there, Jesus continues to reveal his, this is in the bottom of the page. Jesus continues to reveal his relationship with the Father, declaring his divine identity. This is uh, there, uh, proclaiming it indeed. And the deliverance from sin and death that his cross and resurrection will accomplish, you know, his being raised up like the serpent in the desert, uh, uh, the brazen serpent. Uh, there, and the people looked up to that as they were being bitten by these seraph serpents, which had a, a, a very painful bite and uh, potentially fatal. So, uh, and so the, God instructed Moses to put this bronze or brazen or brass serpent statue on a pole. So it, it'll lift that up. So it would be, the people would lift, look up to that and uh, basically venerate it. Uh, as a, but as a symbol, as a symbol of God, it wasn't obviously a 
clithonic deity, you know, what a, an underground de- pagan deity, because uh, snakes would, have, they would think of them of a, a life, you know, of new life because they shed their skin and all this stuff. So they had to, and then, and they just came out of a zoomorphic polytheism in Egypt, you know, where they had, which actually not, it's not that the, the gods actually had the heads of, of animals or something like that. Uh, but uh, that was, there was a totem for each, for these gods, uh, the uh, different animals. And um, so, uh, and the, those animals would be sacred to their particular god. Like Sopek, uh, the crocodile, uh, Bastet, the cat, and uh, others, uh, Hathor, the cow, all of these things. But the, the, the serpent of the desert wasn't that. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, or the the the, uh, the golden calf could have been the apis bull from that, or it could have been Baal or whatever. But it, but it was a competing god, whom they're saying this is the god that delivered you from Egypt. No, it was the Lord who was the god who delivered them from Egypt, and it's a God who's the Lord who will deliver us from uh, ultimately from mortality. One of my favorite Easter hymns is Jesus Lives. Gee, I'm going to sing it. Jesus lives, thy terrors now can no longer death appall us. Jesus lives, and this we know. Sin and hell need not enthrall us. Alleluia. Pardon my voice, but that's the only one I have. So, uh, an enthrall doesn't mean just to, just to charm, it means to enslave, for the uh, old English word thrall for a slave. So I like that, but there are, are there are variants of that, that, that hymn um, in translations. But the, uh, so it, I'll go on here with that too. It's still continuing with, with this. His death and resurrection will accomplish deliverance from sin. Jesus' audience, seemingly the Pharisees from uh, earlier in chapter 8 here, 8, 12 through 20, continue to misunderstand him, for he and they are speaking on two different levels. So this is often the case that uh, uh, they uh, they don't catch what Jesus said because they're thinking in a completely different way from he is, from what, what Jesus is trying to communicate for them. A new line of discussion begins with Jesus repeating what he said in chapter 7, verse 33 to 44, about going away and his audience being unable to follow. But now he adds something new, you will die in your sin. That's very chilling. Oh Lord, may that not be for about where we truly be people of repentance and of that humility which is so needed for authentic repentance, to grow it in that. May many biblical texts witness to a deep connection between sin and death. In Genesis 2.17, God tells Adam that death is the consequence of sin and disobedience, because all sin is, is, is disobedience when we, if we're going against the conscience, going, even natural law, if we're going against natural law, let alone revealed law in the, the commandments. Interpreting Genesis, St. Paul writes that through Adam, quote, sin entered the world and through sin, death. So death is a spirit, certainly. It's Romans 5, 12. In John's gospel, sin, hamatia in the Greek, uh, refers both to acts of personal wrongdoing and to the condition of being separated from God being in a state of sin, that which would be the state of mortal sin. Because the state of venial sins, your, your, uh, your, your relationship is frayed, but it's not broken. But mortal sin, it is broken. And of course, for mortal sin, you remember the conditions? Condition. So it has to be a grave matter, a real, a truly grave, a morally grave matter. You have to know it is, a grave matter, and you have to will it anyway. You have to uh, have a true consent to the will. For, for the, those are the conditions for a mortal sin. 
So, <coughs> so then, uh, where was I? Yes. When Jesus says you will die in your sin, he is talking about dying in a state of separation from God. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. In, in uh, chapter 1, verse 29 in John. And offer eternal life with the Father to all. So it's a universal offer, but will everybody accept that offer? Or, and and uh, persevere in that offer. Persevere in grace. Because Jesus is I am, and that's put in dark print because it's the divine name, I am who am. Only he can heal humanity of sin and reconcile it with the Father. Those who believe in him accept his gift of eternal life with the Father, whereas those who reject him and believe, again, believe uh, pisteo, pistein, to believe, I believe. It's probably better rendered, I have faith. Because it's not, I think doko is to form an opinion in the sense of you know, a belief or something like that. Uh, Dokain. But... Uh, Pistain is, pistis is, is faith, hey pistis. And, um, but it's to have faith. And what is faith in this? Again, it's not just believing the right things, that's part of it. But it's trusting in him and putting that into effect, living it. So dead faith, uh, faith that doesn't work is dead. Faith without works is dead. As uh, James reminds us, and uh, this uh, a faith isolated from life isn't saving faith. It, it 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 might be perfect belief. It might be, you know, all the right theology. We have to remember the devil is the best theologian. He doesn't just believe; he knows. But he has no faith. He does not. It's the opposite of trusting God. He's in total rebellion against God. He wants to take God's place. And he wants us to join in the rebellion. As the serpent says, you will be as gods. But not through the power of grace will be lifted to, uh, to being en God and filled with God. No, it's, it's the rebellion he's, he's trying us to get us into, which uh, he succeeded. But Christ has come to undo that. Christ has come to give us life. And through his, his obedience, he undoes the disobedience. So, uh, because Jesus is I am, the divine name, only he can heal humanity of sin and reconcile it with the Father. Those who believe, that is, have the faith in him, accept his gift of eternal life with the Father, whereas those who reject him refuse his gift and thus die separated from God. So this is, uh, that's the inner faith, which is, you know, it's uh, not, because uh, outer faith, belief and stuff isn't enough. So in fact, you can believe and, and, and lull yourself into saying, I, I can, you know, I, I've, I've punched my ticket and I can, you know, I quote unquote got saved or whatever. So I can do anything I want. I can't lose my salvation. Well, of course, you don't lose your salvation the way you lose your car keys or your house keys, which is why I have them attached to me all the time or they would be long gone. I would never be able to get into the house. But uh, that's not intentional, obvious, obviously. But uh, rejecting your salvation is intentional. Again, through mortal sin, grave, willed, known, evil, embracing that. So, uh, freely willed. <clears throat> so, those who believe in him accept the gift of eternal life with the Father, whereas those who reject him refuse his gift and thus die separated from God. <clears throat> so it's by grace we're saved. So if you reject the grace, you know, that's, <clears throat> it's your fault. Jesus, this is in the middle of page 159. Jesus' audience, again, does not understand him. 
Isn't that usually the case? When they hear him say, where I am going, you cannot come, they think, is he going to kill himself? Jesus explains their incomprehension by contrasting their spiritual affiliation with his own. Jesus belongs to what is above and not to this world, but his uncomprehending audience belong to, belongs to what is below, to, to this world. In spatial terms, Jesus and his audience are communicating on two different levels. They cannot understand him because they think about him only in their own earthly terms and not in his heavenly terms. So they're not seeing with the eyes of the spirit, they're, you know, they're, they're seeing with uh, just uh, material eyes. Mm -hmm. Who is this guy here? He's not even well quaffed or whatever. He's not, you know, uh, he's not in our class. He, you know, we're elites and he's just this nobody from a nowhere place, you know, the, the, from, from a... a, a a laborer family, skilled laborer family. Who is he? Eh. But we know all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. But uh, so you can know about God, but do you know God? Do you experience God? Do you, are you uh, in a close relationship with God? In the Woody Allen movie one time, he was, it, it was uh, what was it, a sleeper? He was supposed to have gone into... Uh, 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 he was frozen or something like that, and he comes out, you know, uh, two centuries later or something. And they said, oh, "We found these pictures." When there's a picture of Billy Graham, and he said, "Oh yeah, he uh, uh, knew God, uh, Jesus personally." He said, "I guess they double dated or something in college or whatever." So, uh, but that's what. But to to know God to experience God. Now, of course, we don't know God in this essence, that you'd have to be God to do that. But we can truly experience God by grace. But the uncreated energies of God, we can experience God. So, uh, and be transformed. So they, they just, uh, they, so the misunderstanding continues. As Jesus identifies himself as I am, his audience asks, who are you? perhaps expecting Jesus to complete his statement, I am. Because they are from below, they do not grasp that he's talking about his divine identity. Jesus calls attention to the fact, <coughs> excuse me, that he has been speaking constantly about his identity. What I told you from the beginning, Jesus says, in the footnote, the Douai Ras version, that's, the uh, the English Catholic version that came up before the the King James did uh, treats the beginning as a title for Jesus, similar to the title the Alpha. Alpha it's, it's, that's the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Jesus says, "I'm the Alpha and the Omega, God's the beginning and the end." That's again a divine claim. In Revelation twenty two thirteen, see Colossians one eighteen and Revelation one eight and. Revelation 21, 6. And it's Revelation, not Revelations. Apocalypse, it's Apocalypse. Uh, there, a lot of people say Revelations, but it's a Revelation, no S. So, uh, since they do not grasp, the gra do not grasp the divine identity, he says, I have much to say to him about you in condemnation. Jesus' interlocutors are mistaken about much. The people who are, quote unquote, in dialogue with him, but it's not a dialogue. It's, uh, they won't uh, open their minds to what Jesus is saying. Jesus' interlocutors are mistaken about much, but... This is not the time to talk about condemnation. Rather, Jesus' mission is to reveal the Father who sent him and to do his work. John then clarifies for his readers what Jesus' audience does not understand. He was speaking to them of the Father. Jesus makes the second statement about the lifting up of the Son of Man on the cross. 
uh, see uh, John 3, 14 and 12, 22. The first statement to Nicodemus reveals the mystery of the cross as salvation in uh, John 3, 14 and 15. The second statement focuses on the cross as the culmination of Jesus' revelation. The verb to lift up has a twofold sense. In a literal way, Jesus will be lifted up physically from the ground when he is nailed to the cross after that. But in a spiritual way, the lifting up on the cross is also his exaltation because he's fulfilling the will of the Father. The cross is where God, who is radical and subsisting, self-giving love, shines forth most radiantly and gloriously. So that uh, the incarnation is the proof that God is love. So, uh, you know, God isn't, isn't out there saying, yeah, you, I, I, you know, I, I feel your pain or whatever, but uh, I can't be bothered to get into it. No, he, uh, he plunges himself into our pain into our struggle, into everything, in the incarnation. Fully God, yet fully human. And not, and no, he doesn't, you know, when Jesus, you know, or the eternal word, I should say, uh, you know, from all eternity, he could have said, well, I'll come when, you know, all people all they have to do is press a button and I can get the message out all over the world. Or I'll come, uh, you know, I'll be born into a family of royalty, of uh, great prestige and luxury and all this other stuff, you know, maybe the son of the emperor of China, something like that or, or whatever. No, he comes in an obscure place, obscure even in Israel, in Nazareth, with an obscure family, sure, they're of the family of David, but given polygamy and all that stuff, they were a dime a dozen. And in uh, uh, the poverty and all of this other stuff, it doesn't have uh, degrees. Didn't say I sat at the feet of this prestigious rabbi or something. Nothing like that. So uh, the, the the poverty, two pigeon poor. But that was the offering. Uh, it uh, when for Jesus for the poor people that was the offering for the firstborn in the temple. Not a lamb, let alone an ox. So, <coughs> the cross is where God, who is radical and subsisting, self-giving love, shines forth most radiantly and gloriously. When the cross is so perceived with eyes of faith, people will realize the revelation of Jesus' divine identity. I am, and of the Father to whom Jesus is perfectly obedient and transparent, it, 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 even in his humanity. Because in his humanity, you know, he, he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to suffer this stuff. He doesn't want to go through all this stuff. Uh, that's perfectly human. But he says, not my will, meaning the human will, but your will, the divine will, be done. <clears throat> so to, to, this total identity with us, even going through the gate of uh, even painful death, and a degrading death. So as the obedient son, Jesus affirms that the father is always with him. The phrase, because I always do what is pleasing to him, is more descriptive than casual. Than ca not casual, cause, <coughs> causal rather. Certainly not casual either. <coughs> causal. That is, the father is not always with Jesus because Jesus is obedient. Rather, Jesus' obedience describes or characterizes his intimate, constant relationship with the Father. Some of the Pharisees are taken with Jesus' manner of speaking, and despite their previous incomprehension, many start to believe in him. And what does, uh, this is the Jerome Biblical, not the new Jerome Biblical, the old Jerome Biblical of 1968, uh, published by... Prentice Hall, Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, Joyzy. And uh, this is uh, Bruce Vowder, CM, a, a, a priest, I believe. <coughs> uh, I bet most of the people in this book are dead now, probably. From that, so. uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, and uh, it's uh, number 63 in the, in, the, in the Jerome Biblical, New Testament part, and uh, page 442. Jesus says he's going away and that the Jews who seek him will seek him in vain. Because they're not seeking him selfishly or, or, or positively, but to condemn him. Uh, rather than he said, uh, you know, the condemnation is yours then. You will die in your sins. This time he is more explicit on the cause and consequence of their <coughs> inability to follow him, or rather their refusal to uh, repent. So again, the Jews speak at a profound, a profound truth unwittingly. Jesus will indeed lay down his life freely, and because of this, <coughs> he will be forever beyond their grasp. And Jesus continues, they belong to the world that cannot give life, but he has come from heaven precisely to give this life. Their obduracy, their stubbornness, is the sure guarantee that they will die in sin since they refuse the life that only he can give, that final impenitence. This life is to be had only by faith in him, the inner faith, uh, by uh, the reality of grace only through grace. Unless you come to believe that I am what I am. Jesus again uses the Old Testament formula of the self, of the divine self-identification. I am. <coughs> that I am was recognized as a title. And it's clear from the Jews' questions. Who is this person then? Jesus' answer has been variously understood. The Greek is obscure. But uh, I told you at the beginning that I am what I am now telling you. Jesus is the one whom his words have constantly revealed him to be. And his, and his very actions, you know, he's been revealing himself as the incarnation of God and as Hamashiach, the Messiah, the, the one they were waiting for. And the, the true high priest, as the book of Hebrews tells us. <coughs> So, there are many things about you that I could speak of and condemn. So, Jesus allows himself to remind his opponents that he has ample ground to condemn them for their attitudes and deeds in his regard. However, you know, especially plotting to kill him. Uh, it's always uh, not terribly polite. <coughs> However, this he does not do. The only thing, the only things I speak of in this world, as it, with the revealing of the Father. But he only speaks the words of the Father. He does not judge. He's not no, there at this. He will be the judge. But he's not doing that now. He wants, wants them to come forward. Even Judas, how, how often Judas had been given all these opportunities, even at the Last Supper. <coughs> He does not judge, but only speaks the words of the Father, which themselves will condemn unbelief because of the truth of their origin. Because they persist in their misunderstanding, Jesus paraphrases his previous statement. When you will raise up the Son of Man, so this is Son of Man, not the Ezekiel Son of Man, the mere human being, which he is, but he's not a mere human being. But this is the Son of, Dan from, uh, the son of Man from Daniel, the heavenly about the ambassador of the Father, the ambassador of God in this. <coughs> so, uh, after the crucifixion and glorification of Christ, when it is too late, they will perceive that he taught the words of life. But even then, it, it won't be too late until they're dead. See James 2.19. The raising up of the Son of Man will entail his return to the Father who sent him. At the same time, however, the Father has always been present with the Son, a fact that has continually been made manifest in Jesus doing the work of the Father. If the believers of this verse are those who are addressed in the following passage, we might conclude that theirs was a very imperfect faith. Indeed, and isn't that... If we're honest about our own faith, isn't that? They had to, we need 
to grow more and more. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The, the prayer of the, uh, the, the demon-possessed son, uh, of, the, 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 of the father, the father's prayer for them. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I have faith, deepen my faith. So, it, since it is very likely that the tabernacles discourse that we talked about before the, for the, uh, the Feast of Booths there, uh, have an artificial unity, it is not necessary to draw this conclusion. This verse may be simply John's reminder that as in 439, Jesus' teaching was at times well received and became the basis of faith. <laughs> there we go. It's my inner chihuahua. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, so let's pray the Our Father, as we say here in the Boston area. Area. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There we are. Christ is risen. He is truly risen. Glory to Jesus Christ. So let's see. How do I stop this? Finish. There's the button. Bye now.